Hi, I'm Kenny Potter, and I'm editor of School and Concert Choral Music for ECS Publishing Group. And I'm here today with Chris Aspas, Director of Choral Activities uh, at Texas Christian University. Chris, welcome. Hey, thanks, Kenny. Great to be here. So, Chris, you and I have known each other a long time, and uh, we're good friends, which I'm proud to say that, and respect you as a human being, and also as a conductor, and also as a composer. And Chris spent uh, a good amount of time at St. Olaf College and now is Director of Core Activities at TCU. For those who were at National Convention this last year, absolutely fantastic programming and performance. And so congratulations to that. I'm giving you the platform to talk about Aspen Hill music. Tell us more about Aspen Hill music. Sure. Well, it all started when I was at St. Olaf. I never really composed outside of a composition class as an undergraduate, or I'd done some arranging for a men's a cappella group in college and in grad school, but nothing kind of formalized. And here I had this tenor bass choir of between, at its lowest, 68, upwards of almost 100 first-year students. So no institutional memory, no idea, but probably a third of them were music majors, you know, as far as not that many were vocal, but a lot of instrumental music. So you had these really talented tenors and basses. And then you had these tenors and basses who had a desire and maybe they sang in church or they maybe sang a little bit in school or they played in band. But here I had this really unique group. And frankly, there wasn't an overwhelming amount of repertoire for them that we could do on 30 days a week for them to feel both challenged, but not overwhelmed. And so I started with arranging for that group and really explored some things. And then I started writing, I had a sabbatical and I actually started writing and arranging for mixed choir. And what I found was at that point in time, especially for the tenor bass repertoire, there wasn't really a niche in the publishing world for that repertoire, just because it didn't fit necessarily all of it, the, the current high school climate for tenor bass choirs and the number of tenor bass choirs at the university level is relatively small in comparison. So there wasn't a huge market for it. So it wasn't necessarily going to get picked up by publishers. And also I was excited about the idea of being able to hold on to copyright and be able to adapt and expand on works that had already been created. So we found at Aspen Hill, let me see, about 11, 12 years ago. And I've still put out works to other publishers that I've been really happy with and excited about. But it's been exciting to see the library grow. And it's works that are all tested. Like they've all been sung, mostly by my groups. But when there are commissions from other colleagues' groups, other ensembles around, all of them have had a chance to be exercised and figure out what could be made better. And so in that regard, it's also kind of a weird publishing house in that it's just my music and some of it fits the church scene, some of it fits high school scene, some of it's middle school repertoire. So it kind of covers a broad array of communities as far as the music goes. But most importantly, I think that for me is that it's music that can be done well. I really want it to fit the voice as well as possible. And, and I want the musicians to feel like they're able to say something, the music. And so that those are even two of my big priorities in kind of expanding the library and keep feeding into Aspen Hill. Well, and I can attest to that. I've programmed Aspen Hill repertoire with my church choir, with my college choir, with my high school honor choirs as well. And yes, from a market perspective, it does span from middle school all the way to college as well as the church choir. So thank you for adding to the choral canon. Appreciate it. <laughs> and so what's new? Anything new that's coming up? Well, yeah, the I'm just I actually just finished some edits on a piece that we're going to premiere here at TCU this fall. It's one of the shortest things I've ever written. It's only about two and a half minutes long uh, setting of Job three. Um, I found a magnificent motet from the Renaissance early Baroque period from Mexico a setting of In Aurore Visionis, which it's my horrible visions are, are making me tremble all the way down to my bones. It's a really kind of spooky text. I love the text so much, but the piece itself, the music of the piece didn't necessarily fit the rest of the program. So I thought I'd explore it a little bit. So it's got a pretty dramatic piano part. It starts with a big, bold, dissonant fanfare and then goes into some do like it opens with a duet with the tenors and basses and the duet then jumps to the sopranos and altos and then it culminates very, very quickly. It reminds me a little in scope to the Orban Damon 
that is so popular. And it starts with a big bang and then kind of just like a nightmare kind of flashes a little bit and then punches you in the gut and then dissipates into nothing. So I'm excited to see that happen, see that come to life. We just adjusted some rhythms yesterday. So again, it's part of the delight of having the students that I have here at TCU is we get to try stuff and see what it works. And they're great about feedback too. They're like, this doesn't work. And so we get to go back to the drawing board and try it again on Thursday. So that's been really cool. I've also been created a performance edition from a Mendelssohn cantata that is Aus tiefer Not, Schreich zu dir, psalm setting. And it's this wonderful little four minute acapella, essentially motet in the style of Bach. You know, there's a lot of fugal or fugato like exchanges but also it's just the wonderful chromaticism that is like Mendelssohn's translation of Bach that creates so much tension and then it kind of eases off and then it gets tense again. And so I'm excited. I changed the key to make it fit the voices better. There's some big leaps and and some range issues in the original that I think would make it for modern younger singers to do. So I've adjusted those. And again, we're working on that for this concert in October. So I'm excited about that. And then I actually went back into my stacks and found about three or four other Edit performance editions of Hostler and Bird mm-hmm. and some other composers who much less well-known works and usually really longer motet that I've actually compressed into shorter works that again I think are, are reasonably accessible and yet they have in my mind a lot of the the powerful expression of of the Renaissance and Baroque that sometimes we don't get in the music that we sing from those time periods. So I got to polish those off and make sure that the markings that I made in rehearsal translate back into the score. But I think there's probably going to be about three, four, five new works that we can get up and running here in the next month or so. So, oh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. That's good. Well, and maybe some people are are wondering, (laughs) why is E.C. Shermer or E.C.S. Publishing talking about another publisher? And the reason we are is because we're partners. Aspen Hill Publishing, we are distributing for Aspen Hill Publishing. And so if you want to know more about Aspen Hill Publishing, you can go to the E.C.S. Publishing website and you can click right on the top you'll see chris's picture and you can click on it and and find out more uh about these new pieces um now speaking of ecs uh i'd be uh not doing my my job if i didn't if i didn't talk about ecs or ask you to talk about it so what are some go-to pieces or composers that you come across when you think of either ec Shermer or galaxy Well, that's really easy. And in fact, I don't know that we have enough time. There's so much from the library. I was actually just perusing the website yesterday by series, which is actually a feature I really love. But the variety of series that are there and what they each represent is so fantastic, whether it's Warland, whether it's Plymouth. I mean, any number of places that I've gone. And I was looking through and I found a lot of old friends actually in these pieces. I mean, obviously the Randall Thompson repertoire is a cornerstone. The Best of Rooms is one of my favorites of his. I think I might have done that with the Chapel Choir my very first year at St. Olaf back in the day. Some of the things that have been making the rounds, I know in the last several years, but maybe have fallen off the radar of some, the Paul Rudoy's Yonder Come Day. So I, I think it's just an exciting piece. I think it's got a lot of character and it captures maybe what I knew to the original. I don't know, it was Judith Cook Tucker or something like that way back in the day in the 90s that I did with treble voices of that tune. Um, more recently, actually it was in the reading session packets for the summer release, Eric Light's All Lang Syne for tenor bass voices. That's hot. That is a romp. Oh my <laughs> gosh. A great piece. It's fantastic. Yeah. And the elements, the addition of the guitar and the folk violin, I think it grants, I think it gives an opportunity for tenor bass choirs to perform something with that's familiar and that's very accessible and yet has a vibe and a drive and a color that I haven't really heard. I think there's a lot about it that's special. And that text is fantastic. It doesn't have to be for New Year's. It's right. a great text. It's a great Oh, text. yeah, totally. Actually, I've got a Galaxy title that I'm doing with Corral right now, the Tiggles Moonlight Sound Design. Mm-hmm. We're working on that. When I got the score, I realized that we could learn it, except for the solo parts, in like two rehearsals. And that's a lot of bang for your buck. Like that's a, gr- and I love the story that Tiggle shares about it and the relationship with his father. I'm excited about doing that one. One of my favorite Christmas pieces is the Colton Below in the Singer series. 
Yeah. Re so cool. I remember teaching it without the piano. Like we did it all on solfege. There's two transitions that I had to kind of finale out to make an harmonic, the solfa work. Mm -hmm. um, but Chapel Choir loved it. I loved it. And I remember Colton telling me once that he realized that the chord changes sound like Cindy Lauper's time after time. So I always think about that when I get out into a TV row. I could hear um, him saying that. <laughs> he didn't realize it until afterwards. And we had a good laugh. I also forgot that it was in the series. I think it's in the Baylor series. Susan Labar's I Hear Thy Voice. The text is so powerful and her part writing, it's challenging. I mean, I don't think it's as musically challenging as it's, you really have to make sure the singers are singing well to have the stamina to do it but it's so beautiful like it's worth it it's such a great piece like th those are some of the things that kind of went through my mind about this and something that I'm going to toot your horn a little bit but the emerging voices series that you all are bringing out to really target developing musicians in places with music that is exciting and accessible and that also has a lot of meaning and I think that students, younger singers can really connect to. So that's something I'm really excited for ECS as far as moving forward and almost redefining relationships with the shareholders, with the choral community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's great. You have definitely hit some highlights. So I appreciate that. And thanks for your kind words on emerging musicians. We're I'm excited really about excited it. about the series. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris, we could continue talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we do need to end but it was great to spend some time with you and for everyone who watched this thank you so much and hopefully you'll go to uh, the ECS website we have lots of resources including new curriculum guides written by Cody Raven Morris and Colleen McNichol and they are rock stars as well you are Chris and we appreciate it and we will talk to everybody later right back at you thanks Kenny all right, see ya.